Action starts. One limber, open limber. Min razor from a small stacker here. So this is not a professional, this is a small stack fish. Um, and we isolate both the min razor and the open limber. And we get min raised as a three bet. So we made a two bet here. Actually he made a two bet for min raise. We make a three bet. This guy makes a really, really small four bet, matter of fact. And it's relatively dangerous given his small um actually almost non existent actually non existent four bet size. Um but he is in the small blind and we're getting really, really good odds to make this call with our nine and with our pair of nines and we do. Flop comes and we whiff hard. Alright, so we've got essentially nothing and you know outside running running a run and runner straight draw and we basically need the nines. So and even if the knights come, of course, then jack queen or five, uh, six, seven is then uh, completed straight, and it's just not looking good for the home team. Um, but we are both still relatively big stacked, and this guy comes out with a really small sized C bet. All right, so just look at the odds the guy's giving me. Um, if I were on nine jack, for example, um, I just call this straight and play on in position. Um, with my with my draw, it's giving me here six and a half or uh, six point six seven exactly to one odds. I only need thirteen percent equity to call that flat. Um, so as I don't have a really strong hand here, and I'm not really on the draw as such, I want to go ahead and take it down now because again, small bets, bet sizes from fishy kind of players, mm. nitty players, for example, here he's only getting to the showdown fourteen percent of the time and winning over half when he does. So I'm going to be able to push this guy off a hell of a lot of hands uh, on the turn in the river. So I opt for a raise. And this is a very small raise because I think that I'm going to have similar effects with smaller bet sizing uh, against this player. right? So I can risk less with a very similar effect knowing his pain levels are quite low. That means it stings even when it's a small raise for this guy. This is kind of nitty play, you know. He's getting the showdown one time in seven, playing every fifth hand only raising every 20th kind of kind of guy um, he's going to be pushed off of the river 75 percent of the time turn 65 percent of the time and yeah we've got over 700 hands on the guy so I opt for a raise and there it is and he then only calls so the pot's now 33 all right and that's essentially his stack size all right it's two-thirds of mine and so here if he's got a strong hand he needs to go ahead and be uh, betting that, I mean, at least half pot and maybe even just pushing now. So let's see. He probably checks it. Not, you know, at this point, I'm putting this kind of guy who makes a really small four bet from the small blind on something like ace, you know, ace queen, ace king, um, more than likely ace king in this spot. And yeah, so he checks it, you know, being a totally uncreative player. And it's 33 bucks in here, and I think I'll be able to get him off the hand with probably a smaller bet. Let's see what I do. Yeah, so I only bet one third of this pot. So if he did come at us with kings or queens uh, or aces, and he comes over the top right here, I can let it go, and you know save all that money. I think that he's going to let go of this hand with a third pot size bet as often as he will. Well, maybe not as often, but pretty similar to a half or a two thirds pot size bet. So that's the idea of, of varying my bet right here against this kind of player. And he does let it go, and we take it down with our nines. So, using your position to your advantage even when you don't have the hand. Outplaying your opponent's post flop. Alright, so one open limper we're playing here, as you guys see, NL 100. And uh, open limp. And this guy raises it up to three. And that's a two bet. And we make it a really small three bet for 575 somehow. We just basically mid raise the guy with our jacks in position. So jacks don't get too crazy about them. I mean, again, uh, proper three bet size would have then been, of course, at least nine, probably ten, given the limper. Um, but yeah, if we get re-raised with jacks, it's sometimes difficult, depending on how often this guy is re-raising. But again, you know, I'm seeing this guy. He's he's limping 31% of the time, um, raising middle position at 11. Yeah, and 
yeah, I think I'll be able to outplay him actually a hell of a lot. He's also calling station here, and yeah, there's a lot of things going for us here post-flop, and we'll see how this develops. And we do get a call and a, another call. So this guy played 2-bet, call the 3-bet, and the flop comes all under cards. 2-suited, 8-9, uh, so it's semi-connected, but we do have the jack, so the connectivity is not such an issue. All worried about, you know, the flush draw against two opponents a bit. And 18 in the middle. Call it 19, and we get check one, check two, and I bet it pretty strong, of course, because I'm looking at this you know, two-suited board, and yeah, I put it just under pot size, and I do get a call by the limp call guy. <laughs> All right, limp call pre-flop, check call, flop. That's starting to look a little more dangerous. And now the three comes. It's a big blank. And there's 50, let's call it, okay, whatever, 49 in the pot. And we're playing in a 100, so this is also the total amount of big blinds. And that's, you know, two-thirds of his stack, um, even more of mine. And so we're getting into stack scenarios already. He checks again, and I make a hefty all-in move. Because I know if I only bet half pot, let's say, I only bet, um, let's call it 30, whatever. Let's say I only bet 30 here. Right, how much am I going to have left on the on the river? Yeah, not a hell of a lot. Yeah, And in comparison to the pot, I mean, it, it's completely insignificant. And, and his play is very indicative of some kind of a flush draw, uh, maybe a straight draw. You know, uh, he may even have overcards. Who knows? But anyways, I'm putting him on a draw, and I'm putting my money to that idea. And that means I'm not... You know, I'm not going to just bet maybe half pot or a quarter pot here against this guy, uh, who's getting to the showdown 33% of the time, uh, folding relatively rarely on the turn here at 56%. And, yeah, I know that I'm pot committed more or less on every river, so I go ahead and push now to get maximum fold equity on my side after he checks to me again. So I don't want to give him a free card here and let him uh, draw out on me. So, instead of just a normal bet, I go ahead and push, and that's called overbetting the pot. That's exactly what I did, and he let it go. So... Uh, just to follow up on that, what kind of pot odds he's going to get, because uh, he does have me covered. Right, He needs 38% completion probability to make that call. Right? And if he is on a flush draw, then he's only got 19. And yeah, there you go. Okay, so here, a uh, little shorthanded, uh, 7 player, NL50, we got suited 10-9, max stretch in the hijack position, no, in the cutoff, here's the button kind of hidden underneath his stats, and we raise it up as a steal, two, three and a half big blinds, very standard, get called here by the player on the button, who has very strong stats, by the way, 15% uh, VPIP, he's up, he's running at 17 big blinds per 100, uh, strong player, all in all, and good, so he calls his cold, and we get another call. Alright, so here we flop the open-ended nut straight draw. 8, 9, 10 jack on a rainbow board. So this is, rainbow boards are where you need to be playing your straight draws. And the good thing about straight draws is you have high, much higher implied odds than uh, you do on flush, flush draws. Because when that third, like I said, when that third suit hits the board, then very many opponents freeze up. So just know that your implied odds are higher, of course, in any given pot when there are more than two, two opponents. And they're also higher when you're on kind of disguised draws, right? namely straights, um, funky two pairs, uh, full houses even sometimes, um, but especially straights. Okay, so we've got five and a half here in the middle, 11 big lines in our NL50 game here. And I bet it out. Okay, standard C bet, um, half pot on a non-suited, non-connected board, and that is a C-bet semi-bluff, okay, because I do have a lot of outs here, uh, namely eight, <laughs> and this guy calls again in position, so this is a good place for him also to float me, namely call my C-bet, knowing that I C-bet way too much here at 78%, <laughs> um, and well, let's just have a look, yeah, um, yeah, C bet and two bet flops at uh, or two bet pots at um, almost eighty percent, and then three bet pots <laughs> at eighty two. So I mean, against a player like me who's very aggressive at a five aggression factor, 
See, that's way too much. <laughs> uh, calling and floating me on on the on the flop is a very very strong play very often, especially when the stack sizes are are deep or big. Good. So here comes my money card. Um, flop the seven, and you just can't can't beat that card at all. So I've got the absolute nuts at this point, and you know now it is too suited. If for some funky reason, if you were on an ace jack kind of queen clubby hand. Then he does have a redraw. And yeah, we'll see how this goes. I decided to go ahead and yeah, make a, a solid bet here um, so that he also uh, doesn't float me. And quite honestly, if this is any other card, I'm, I'm very likely to go ahead and second barrel on that turn anyways. Yeah. Um, good. So I mean, I'll be making this move also when the 7 or the Queen doesn't hit. Right, and that's how you need to be thinking. You know, I'll be playing this hand exactly the same way with different with different holdings and that's that's gonna keep you unreadable so this guy then calls me again so this could be also a long ball float <laughs> so to say call the flop call the turn bet the river it's also a line um, you know if he thinks that I missed now another thing is here uh, let's say he is on the flush draw okay he doesn't have the odds to call that right he's only gonna have 19 percent to make that call if he's on a bare flush draw but Something that's also less likely is this running, running, a runner, runner flushes. Okay, or so-called uh, backdoor flushes. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna put him on a flush draw when that club comes on the river a lot, because it's gonna be a situation where he needs both of those cards, both the turn and the river, to be clubs in order to make his flush. It's also a bit disguised, kind of like your your straight. So, again, when you're holding um, cards, you know, with this ace, let's let's say you had ace jack of clubs, right, and then the seven comes. That's also a really good place just to call, right? And then maybe play for stacks when you hit hard, you know, another jack, another ace, uh, any club. Yeah, you can also even just raise directly right here uh, if you don't put me on 10-9. <laughs> right, so there's a lot of options here. In position, this guy's really, you know, he's got the whole world open to him. And he could have done he could have done a lot of stuff, but he, he opts in for another call. Uh, that was my second barrel continuation bet. All right, and again, the continuation bet doesn't mean just a bluff. It's also when you when you complete, when you actually have a proper hand. And again, it's a post-flop positional move. So I was a pre-flop aggressor, bet the flop, turn comes, I bet the turn again. That's my second barrel, and I get called yet again. All right, and there's a six. Now, you know that he missed his flush if he were on one. Um, I've still got the absolute nuts, and. Yeah, I can only hope that he's on, you know, set of two, set of eights, uh, any jack, and yeah, I go ahead and bet pot, thinking that after all that calling, he'll pay me off. This can be, when you bet pot on the end, it can also be a situation where I've got ace-queen or ace-king, right, or any under pair, and I'm just continuing my aggression, triple barreling, so-called triple barrel C bet, continuation bet, all the way to the end. So this bet here, this pot size bet, it's going to be a strong hand, it's going to often be a bluff. And I've only got 11, 23 left, so I could have just gone ahead and pushed it all in to make it look like a, a really strong strong hand, or a, a bluff with maximum fold equity. So anyways, I just bet the pot, um, and if he does have any kind of hand, he's going to come over the top when I have the nuts. And yeah, there you go. So just be sure that you're going to be betting pots also when you miss when you're triple barreling with air, um, that would be kind of the idea with this kind of bet size. Yeah, not just to be throwing out any bet size, but thinking, okay, what would I do when I uh, when I miss this flop completely, the turn and the river? Um, am I able to outplay this guy like that? Uh, how often is he going to let it go? Here we're seeing here 67% of the time on the river. He's only getting there 25% of the time. You know, keep these stats in mind uh, and play consistently when you're both on your monsters as we are here. Uh, semi-bluffing the flop, hitting the turn, playing consistently into the river, and then throwing out a bet that he could perceive as a bluff. Good. Next hand.